Okay, so I'll get started on my presentation, and uh, I'm actually not going to take a full hour to do this, because I'm only going to be presenting material which we've done since the last Estes Park meeting, and basically it's, it's mostly experimental work. There's no theory in this. I'm just going to show you the, the new experiments that have been covered, um, and uh, the new V to the fourth measurements that have been taken, and exactly how we, how we took them. So uh, up front here, you see, uh, here is the mega device. This little guy here is about three centimeters or three and a half centimeters long. Uh, it's uh, 30 millimeters wide. Uh, the discs that you see, that in fact you see it better in this little cartoon image here. There's, there's eight two millimeter thick uh, PZT discs. That's lead zirconate titanate. And uh, you also see two smaller ones. And those are what we call the, uh, the strain gauges or uh, Jim calls them accelerometers. And they're the thinner plates that are only 0.3 millimeters thick. Of course, between all these things, we've got um, uh, brass electrodes, and all the grounds are connected together, and all the positives of the, of the eight plates are connected together uh, to, to, with the tabs so that we can put the power to them. But then these uh, little, the thin electrodes have their own positives so that we can just take out the, the current that they, that they produce. So those, those thin ones are not powered. We actually take the current and voltage from those to get the strain gauge information out. Um, what you see here is an, is an aluminum end plate, and uh, here's the brass mass, and these screws go, uh, these are uh, 256 volts, and they go into the brass, and these are 440 volts, and they basically hold um, this, this L-shaped bracket onto the brass mass. And in between the brass mass and, and the, the uh, uh, bracket is a rubber pad, which has been cut down to almost little O-rings around the 440 volts, and that's pretty much all that's left of that. Anyway, moving on, so that's what the thing looks like. Uh, oh my goodness, it's a one-dimensional model with no damping. I'm gonna just... <laughs> you didn't see that, Jose. So here's an actual picture of the device. <laughs> okay, you should ask questions right now. <laughs> well, actually, um, <laughs> um, I only put this up here the just because... The third term there, I'm a little confused. <laughs> <laughs> The only bit I wanted to show, this, this was a work by a good colleague and friend of mine, uh, Keith Wanzer. He just wanted to show that if you had variable mass, you could, in fact, have the center of mass motion of this mm. thing change. And that's really all I wanted to show here. So This is, it, this is analogous to the, the person's really the child yeah. swinging their legs on yeah. a swinging swing. Pretty and, much. And people said that that was impossible, right? but and kids yet were doing it, works. it on the playground all the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but uh, all I wanted to show is that uh, here's the here's a rate of change of momentum, and as you see, it goes like m dot x dot, m dot, x dot, and the two masses are the two masses here. Although there's no damping in this, so clearly it's, it's, it's not even wrong, but I just wanted to show that even in something this simple, if you allow the mass to change, you get unexpected uh, results. But I, I, don't, I don't see a one degree of freedom system there. I see two degree of freedom. Oh, you mean the two masses? Yes. Okay, fine. <laughs> Moving on. Um, and one and two. One and two, you're right, you're right. Um, so I, I just said that even with something that simple, with something that simple, you can actually predict um, a force. Um, so let's say that the, 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 the little device is moving on the order of a few microns. That's what the student Tom Mahood did with an experiment, an interferometric, interferometric type experiment. He showed that it was about three to five microns of, of displacement. Uh, the resonant frequency of operation, let's assume that it's something like 36 kilohertz. Um, and that, uh, so if you take the, the period of oscillation, that's invert the frequency, you get uh, something like 10 to the minus five seconds. So that if you take this little distance, the distance over the time, you get a, a velocity. And then uh, and using our power and current and voltage, you get roughly the power here. And uh, I can put it into this little formula for delta m. So from the delta m calculation and the, the, the velocity calculation, I can just use that m dot v dot, and it actually gives me a result of about one micronewton. So even something so incredibly basic gives you a rough order of magnitude type rough, rough effect. But of course, this hasn't got damping in it, so it's not a, a very realistic type model. And so I, I am going to just move on and uh, show you the experimental results, which are somewhat more interesting. So here is actually the device again. And this one's so close up, you can actually see the individual disks in there. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, uh, we, we are trying to use different materials now. So this, this is the same sort of picture you saw at Estes Park, but uh, we have since acquired different materials, and I'll, I'll show you why. And uh, also we have what was called the magic cube. The magic cube made of PIN PMNPT. It's actual crystalline material, and we're hoping to test that uh, in the near future. But we, we, it's not quite ready for testing yet, but, but maybe sometime soon. We're hoping because it has much better properties that we may get a, a larger thrust from it. Um, 
Now, how do we measure this thing? Well, this is a, a quick diagram from Jim. Uh, you see here that uh, we've got flexural bearings on the central column, and uh, they're powered with the Galastan power contacts, the liquid metal contacts. On one end of the beam, we have the thruster in, in its Faraday cage, and on the other end of the beam, you have the, the fixed um, optical sensor, the Filtech optical sensor, and the reflector is attached to the actual beam itself. So the reflector does the moving, this thing stays stationary. And of course, on, to balance the weight of the thruster, we have a counterpoise, which is just a bunch of brass masses, basically. So that's the, what the system is in schematic. Um, this is what it actually looks like. So here you see the central column, and uh, in here are, are the Galastan contacts, which I'll show on the next slide. They're a bit bigger, you can see them better. Here's our Faraday cage. Um, over here you see the Filtec sensor, here's the, obviously the counterpoise, the Filtec sensor. What you can't see very well is, this, is the reflector because it's hidden behind the, 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 the armature here. The, so this thing would swing sort of this way out of the, out of the board and, and swing back the other way. Um, so let me show, oh, oh, and here of course is the, the damper. So it's a magnetic damper of the same type that, uh, that uh, Martin uses, it's just neodymium magnets in there. Uh, we also have coils. These coils are only powered if we want to test out the force uh, and, and calibrate the force of the system. So uh, I know pe most people have seen this before. It's just for the people that have not seen it. This is, a, this is Jim's balance. Here you see the Galastan contacts. They're directly above uh, the central column. And here's what the C-flex bearings look like. They're just these, uh, again, they're, they're fairly often used. And uh, they just flex a little bit. They twist and uh, with a very known, a known uh, torsion, so we can calculate uh, the torque on, on these things. So that's basically the experimental uh, setup. Um, oh, and there's croc. Uh, I always have to show croc. Uh, and there's our plastic chamber and uh, with the balance inside of it. This is, by the way, our old lab. Uh, quite a lot of time has been spent moving our old lab into a new location on the fifth floor, the chemistry department. And uh, we're now in a lab which is about 10 feet by about 13 feet. So it's very small. We've had to make quite a few changes. And I'll show you a picture of the lab at the end, of the new lab uh, I'll show you. So, uh, so there's our acrylic vacuum chamber. Of course, things like the vacuum pipes and all that have had to be changed and uh, uh, switched around a little bit. Um, when we, we mentioned that uh, when we do the experiments, we, do, we run the, the test device in one direction and then we flip it 180 degrees. Now that's fairly easy to do with this setup because what we have here is a little bolt here, this, this thin little bolt, and uh, this lock knot we can untie and then this whole chamber just, just flips 180 degrees. So if the brass end is at this side, when you flip it, the brass end will be at the other side. So literally you just turn the whole thing 180 so it's running in the opposite direction. And that's, that's basically what we do uh, for that. Uh, this is a ground cable and it's actually touching the Faraday cage. And also there's uh, copper around the power uh, input and it's, all, it's clipped onto the copper and the copper the alligator clip is actually touching the metal cage as well, so it's all nicely grounded. And there's a close-up of our, our magnetic damper. And uh, again, you see the Filtech sensor here. And there's, this is a, a stepper motor where you can move, it, move the thing in and out a little bit. Aha, so from uh, Estes Park, I just thought I'd start with what you've seen before and then move on. So uh, this is the kind of thing that you get after possibly 12 runs and averaging over 12 runs. So you see noise, 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 noise. And then this blue line indicates the voltage that's applied. So the voltage was applied for about, looks like about 14 seconds there. Um, and uh, switch on, you get, a, you, get, you get a transient, and then it swings back because, of course, it's a, it's a pendulum balance, so it, the pendulum is going to swing a little bit. So it swings one way, swings back the other way, and then you get a, 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 the steady thrust. So this is a kind of a steady thrust level above the noise. And then we switch off, and then we get a transient the other way. Again, swing back a little bit, and noise, 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 noise. So that's an average of about 12 runs. Uh, just for comparison, here's actually, I think it's supposed to be one run from uh, Nembo Baldrini in Austria. And uh, here you see noise, noise, noise. There's a transient. There's the steady thrust level. And there's another transient switch off. And here's uh, the, the noise level again. And here's basically what's going on. You see you switch on transient, steady thrust, switch off transient, zero line. Notice that um, uh, in this picture, you notice it's about 0.15 micronewtons. And uh, this is a device sent to Nembo by, by uh, Jim. And in, this, in here, you see it's about one, two, maybe two and a half, two or two and a half micronewtons here. And you may think, well, what's the difference? This is 0.15 micronewton, and this is almost two micronewtons. Well, the difference is that Jim was running on 200 volts uh, amplitude. And Nembo was running on 200 volts peak to peak. Okay, so basically Nembo had uh, half the voltage 
that Jim was running at. So think of two, and I'm going to show later on that we think that the, the, the thrust scales as v to the fourth. So think of a factor of two times two times two times two, you get 16, and a sixteenth of two is about an eighth, yeah? 2.4. So, uh, two, well, well it's, it's, it's pretty much it's going, going from two micronewtons and then the sixteenth of it, uh, we're, we're getting roughly to that number. So that's not, not too bad, is it? So you can explain the numbers just by the fact that the voltage was different for the two, to two runs. So this is all stuff that we showed at Estes Park, so nothing new yet. Um, yes, shall I go back? Oh, I had a question? Well, maybe not. I'll come back later well, then. Let me ask you a question. The, the switching transients, are you literally switching on the square wave or are you ramping? Uh, we're switching on. This is actually a square wave here. It looks pretty square to me. This this thing right here. So it's a Why switched not use on. A ramp instead of a, 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 a ramp Coming to that. <laughs> Coming to that. Uh, so we will. In fact, that's. I'm about to talk about uh, exactly that that effect. So the transients seem to give a higher thrust. You notice than the steady thrust shown, right? And you're wondering, well, can we actually use those transients rather than the steady thrust? Um, and, but the thing is, the on and off are in opposite directions. So if we just do what we're doing, we're going to get a transient one way, a transient the other way, and they cancel out, so that's not very helpful. But uh, we, we can still look at, overcome that problem by using uh, a, a chirp, basically trying to eliminate one of those transients and just use one of them rather than the other, rather than having the both. So let me show you how that works. Um, you see that we have... Um, the, the discs that we have, 90 millimeter discs of PZT, uh, SM, that's Steiner Martins 111. It was a three quarter inch length brass mass, and uh, the aluminum end mass was a quarter inch thick, and the resonance frequency was 36 kilohertz. Now, what you'll see is a plot. Uh, the thrust is in red, the voltage is in blue, the strain gauge is, sh is shown in, in this weird brown color, and then the VCO, uh, the voltage control oscillator, is in green. So let me just show you uh, the next slide. So I'll just remind you, the thrust is in red, the voltage, applied voltage is in, in blue, um, the, this brown color is the, is the strain gauge or accelerometer, and then this is just the control voltage, which you now see is being ramped. Now this is actually shown upside down, so it started at a high frequency and actually went lower, so it's, it's inverted here. But here you see that we're starting um, at a higher frequency and then um, actually going down onto resonance. So we've managed to, since we're starting with a voltage off resonance, you're not seeing much power being, being absorbed. Um, it, it, the, basically the power comes on when we actually start to hit the resonance frequency. And then, uh, so here's hitting the resonance frequency, and then of course there's the power off, where you get the transient. So you're seeing uh, a resonance happening, and then a, a transient, and a, a swing back, and then back to the noise and then a second, a second pulse. So we can in fact switch off that first transient. So it, it might be sensible to just try to have the transients as a pulse, 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 and make that the little, little thruster. So that's one way to go. Uh, let me go to the next slide. Um, and you might be wondering, how do we know what is the resonance frequency? Well, we have started to use this uh, uh, Stanford Research 780 VNA. But I should point out that um, when we use that device, we're only running at about five volts. So it's, it's almost like a big com an old computer. It, the voltage on it is about five volts. Uh, the, the little device is, is sitting in its half Faraday cage and it's got a, a kilohertz, a kilohertz ohm uh, little resistor in series with it when I plug it into this device. I believe the device itself has a 50 ohm um, uh, resistance uh, to it. So. Uh, so this is the kind of plot that we get when we just run the five volts uh, through the device. It looks something like this. And we're thinking that this impedance dip here, this first one, is very, very close to the, the resonance of the device that we should run at. So it's not exactly on that number, but it's, it's a little bit, usually a little bit shifted to one side, but um, not, not quite that far, but just a little bit different to that number right there. So that's how we've been guesstimating where this frequency, uh, the resonance frequency is. Uh, here's a few more of the chirps. So you see a whole uh, section. So, so here you see where the voltage hits the resonance, we get a, a bump, and then we get another bump as we switch off. And similarly again, you get a bump and a bump, and here's a whole, whole row of them. They look rather pretty, so uh, I just showed a, a few there. Um, and I've, I've got a few more runs. Um, here's one that where you see a bit of thermal drift. There's sort of a bit of a drift in that, but not, not, too, bad, uh, not too badly. Um, I think now that the device has been reversed. So uh, you see uh, there's a, the, the pulse is in the opposite direction here. So you see the pulse now going down. Okay, so that's the reverse direction. And here's something interesting happened. 
Um, it turns out that Jim was running the device and uh, uh, he'd, he'd started slightly off resonance. So these, these pulses here aren't as, as pronounced as they were previously because he wasn't quite on resonance. It says the first two chirps are at 37 kilohertz. Uh, um, so he, he was slightly a, a, above the resonance that he wanted to be at. Um, and then realizing the error, uh, the frequency was changed to 35.8, which is slightly below the resonance. So the, uh, the power is actually going to go, is actually going to chirp through the resonance. So you're going to go below, uh, above and then at resonance and then also below. So you notice this interesting curve that's happening in these last two. Uh, we're seeing uh, a pulse, a pulse, a pulse. And here you see, now that he's, he's altered, he was, so he was in the process of altering the frequency here. And this last one, it's actually been altered. So he gets slightly above um, at the resonance and slightly below the resonance he's seeing. So that's the switch off transient. So, but we're getting a reversal. And I think that was something that, uh, that Jose was seeing also in, in his code, that uh, in, in, the, in the numerical model, you're actually getting a reversal of, of the thing. Yes? So just to clarify, all the pulse chirps we've seen so far, all the pulse traits and the chirps we've seen, those are all single runs, no averaging. Right, no averaging. No averaging. In fact, this is also a, a, a single run, but you see in the single run, I've got four chirps. Right. So um, and when I talk about chirps later, I'm talking about these individual ones and they're not averaged at all. This individual chirps is what I'm talking about. So here's four chirps and I, I treat each chirp as a separate, uh, separate little run by itself. Mm -hmm. Well, what's yes. the green scale one? Oh, the green is the uh, voltage control oscillator. So it's just telling you how this voltage is switched on. So it actually starts at a high frequency and then sort of quadratically sweeps through the frequency down to the resonance and then suddenly switches off. So it goes slightly below the resonance and then switches off. Is it Yes, okay. yes. So, uh, yeah, sorry about this. Isn't a, it's actually just showing a voltage in, in, in DC voltage. So it's a scaled voltage. Yeah, these voltages aren't, aren't all that helpful. I think um, at the top of my graphs, I'd been writing down what the conversion was from volts to, uh, it's about 0.15 volts uh, is about a micronewton or something of that nature. So that, that was actually written at the top, but I think it's been cut off. Uh, I'm lost. The, the, the scale is kilohertz? Or uh, the scale of the green one is, is it would be kilohertz, but all the ones that you're seeing here are all voltage, because they're all just the voltages taken by the picoscope. This is a picoscope uh, 4420 four, 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 or something like that. I can't remember the name of it, but it's got four inputs. So it's a, a 4000 model with four inputs. Um, oh, by the way, we've recently gone up to eight inputs, so now we have one that can, we can take eight different uh, readings, which we're very excited about, so uh, <laughs> we just recently got that. Um, moving on, uh, here's just some more pretty runs, and uh, let me get to the good stuff. Ah, yes, uh, here's the, uh, <laughs> I say this is the good stuff. This was the previous meeting in Estes Park, and uh, I'm sorry we couldn't uh, arrange to have the double rainbow again, but it was rather nice. Uh, so. Uh, so I think all these, the, the chirps, we actually did already have the chirps at Estes Park. So I want to now show you the new material that w was not at Estes Park. So this is now moving on to the brand new stuff. And the brand new stuff was what, what are the developments and, and what kind of improvements can be made. Uh, let's see. Oh, first of all, these were the replications made or, or people working on the uh, device which had shown, uh, had shown similar kinds of results. But uh, what, were the, what are the improvements that we can make beyond what we saw at Estes Park? Well, we were interested in the quality of the material that we were using. So I discovered that, uh, much to my amazement, that we actually have a scanning electron microscope at Fullerton. Uh, the, the, the biologists were very kind to let me, let me use their equipment. And uh, I took one of, these, uh, one of these little discs and mounted it onto one of these little tiny three eighths of an inch diameter uh, aluminum cylinders and stuck it into, into this monster of machine here. And um, using the rather old, <laughs> rather old technology, but it works. It works. Um, we we took a look at what the, this material looks like under under the electron microscope, and this is what we saw. So uh, it seems to be the, all these great big holes. And you see the the grain size of the of the uh, sintered material. So this is 10 microns here. So it looks like the grain size structure. They're all different sizes, uh, between two and maybe six or so microns in, in diameter. And uh, notice all these black spots. Well, they're basically holes. They're voids in the material. Uh, this is what it looks like at 50 microns. So you can see all the holes that we saw uh, in that material. So this is the SM111 material that we've been using. And uh, Steiner Martins claims that it has a quality of factor of 1800. Uh, Martin measured it to be 60, right? So, 
That, that, that was the whole stack. This is one disc, and we just want, I just put the one disc on this, it wouldn't, the whole thing wouldn't fit. But this, the quality of the stack, uh, this, this is of course, would be one disc for Steiner Martins, and, and the quality of the stack was, was 60, as measured by Martin. Um, and we think this is, this is probably why, because it's got all these holes in it, and of course we're putting them on also under compression, so it looks pretty nasty. So we thought, well, why not buy some different material and see what that looks like, and if it's any better. Um, different different uh, quality of, of it. So uh, I went to APC uh, Limited and uh, they gave us some material which we I took a look at and again the, the quality factor that they quote is 1500 and uh, this is what it looked like. It seemed to be fewer, the grain size was very similar. It, it also was between two and maybe six or seven uh, microns in diameter but there seemed to be fewer holes. So looking at between this and this, this one seemed to have the dark, there's a bit of um, discharge going on here, I think. I think I was slightly at too high a voltage. So I was at eight kilovolts. I, I was probably overdoing it a little bit and I was getting, because it's a capacitor, basically the thing was charging up and that's why it looks a bit glowy. So this one wasn't so glowy. Uh, this was also eight kilovolts though, but it didn't glow as much as, as this one did. But um, so the material was glowing like crazy and discharging all over the place, but it didn't have so many holes. So we were thinking possibly this material might be a, a little better. Uh, it, it has a, a good Q and, and we have made uh, measurements, but we haven't made measurements on the stack yet for the quality factor. Yes. So uh, do we have any better answer as far as what material was the one that uh, Martin showed in his test to have a first natural frequency uh, much higher? I have a suspicion that it was the APC material. I have a suspicion it was APC. Which one? What's APC? Because if I have an APC there, it says it is continued, like 44. Oh, the, the material was discontinued. I was buying samples because they were cheaper. So I was buying... <laughs> Um, yeah, we do. Uh, this particular one was the 844 material. But is that the one that you think is the one? I think, I think very much likely that is the one that we sent to Martin, but I have to double check. So I wrote down the material number and everything, so I'll know when I get back to my, my office. I've, got, I've written it down in my, my notebook. Have yes. You, have you tested that 844 material? No, we have not, because um, we find that the, um, the electrostriction isn't, isn't as, as, as high as, whoops, as in... Um, uh, the Steiner Martins, so we'd have to apply two voltages to it. We have to uh, apply. You're measuring electrostriction. No, I wish we could, but. Uh, so how do you know if that is, is not applied? Well, we, we tried. I think we tried using it, and we weren't getting anything. So we think we have to apply two frequencies. So we're not getting the same um, doubling of frequency that we are seeing in the uh, in the Steiner Martins so, material. So you did try to use two. We we did try to run it, yes, and we weren't really seeing anything. Yes. In, um, what frequencies? Um, I, I haven't got a, a VNA scan to show you, but I think they were around the 30 kilohertz uh, mark. Instead of, instead of being 60? Uh, there was, there was, I think there were some that were around 30, and there were more that were around 60, and then some that were even higher. And uh, we must have given Martin one of the higher ones. So, um, so that's, I think there were a few that looked like they were around 65. Uh, it looked like there was something small going on at lower frequency, but then the, the larger dips were actually at higher frequency. And that's what was happening with the APC material. So um, I'll double check when I get to back to my, my lab. I'll, I'll double check the uh, f exact value of it. Um, and I can definitely, I definitely know exactly which one Martin had because I, I wrote it down. Yes. Um, this is a question to you or, or maybe Jose. <coughs> can you check with SEM whether your crystal is correctly pulled? Well, we can. There are there are ways to check the polling. All we need to do is put them between two contacts and actually just apply pressure and then just measure the voltage. So we, we should be able to figure that out. That's not too terrible. But um, I must say, sometimes uh, they put a little dot on one side, say which is the positive side, and sometimes that dot carries over to the next crystal, so you find dots on both sides. So it's it's actually quite easy to make a mistake and think one side's positive and the other one is. So it's it's best to check. Especially if the, if the dots uh, are... Uh, I mean, that there might be a region in the crystal which is not pulled I uniformly see. with the rest of the disk, and that's maybe not what you would be able to see with that, that right, method right. described. Okay, I see what you mean. Uh, you, so you mean there's, there's different polarities over the surface of the crystal? Yeah. I, haven't, I, I don't know any way to check for that. Um, be a bit awkward. Anyway, um, another thing. 
Uh, Jose also suggested, um, uh, suggested he looked, suggested looking at different materials as, as well, and, but he, just, he did suggest to, to look at uh, Fujifilm and the pressure, dis pressure distribution over the surface uh, when we're using these, these discs, especially since we're about to move on to crystals and we were worried that we might be applying too much pressure to the crystal and maybe crack it. So um, we did get hold of this Fujifilm, the medium stuff seemed to be the right uh, uh, range to use. and. Uh, uh, so there's the aluminum cap, there's a brass mass, and we put uh, the, the Fujifilm in there along with a, a stack, and then just uh, crank it down like normal, like four inch pounds or, or the usual settings that we had. And um, we were expecting to see a nice uniform distribution of, of pressure. Ha ha, no, that's not what we got. What we got was a nice ring around where the, where the bolts were. So this is a nice contact pressure. Of the of the bolts around the outside, that's, and that's, that's what I would expect from well, that's what you would expect. But uh, I'm not an, a mecha an engineer, so I, I wasn't expecting that at all. Um, and I was actually kind of shocked that, uh, mm -hmm. that we didn't break all these crystals. So uh, this was uh, looking at the uh, here's the actual disc right here. It was right at the top of the of the range. So we were talking about 7,200 psi around the edge, and in the middle. Um, it was way down here, so it was more like 900 psi in the middle and 7,200 around the outside. So I was actually shocked that we, we hadn't cracked more discs and made a mess of them, or chipped them on the edge or some such. So uh, Jose came up with the idea. <coughs> oh, and here's just another look. Um, I actually sent off the first one. They gave me a, a free sample uh, to, to actually do this in color. And here's the, here's the plot that they did, the profile going across like this. That's the profile. And you can read it off here. It's something like 7,200. That was pretty embarrassing. So it, nowhere, nowhere close to a nice even distribution that we wanted. Hey, you may actually have been cracking the discs, but you have adhesive between the discs. Yeah. So yeah. the adhesive might have actually just been holding it together. Holding it together. There might have been the crack there. Or yeah. filled in the crack. Or filled in the crack. You know, it's it, it, yeah, quite it's, possible. <laughs> yeah. Um, Anyway, one solution uh, is, of course, just to use some kind of captain film. It's the kind of malleable film that you could put between the ends and, and then it squishes down and, and, and makes its own little molded layer, and that might help. Uh, but another possibility is to actually take the end masses and uh, actually make it a dome on them, something like this. So it's actually quite flat. The height of this thing was 8.8 thousandths of an inch. So we're talking... A, 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 quite a, a machining job there. So luckily we do have a very, very good machinist. And uh, the machinist did dome both the aluminum uh, end cap and also the brass mass. And then I, again, I put the Fujifilm in there and I clamped it down and then I got this. Mm. Um, so this was fairly even distribution and it turned out to be 3057 PSI uh, pretty much across the whole thing. So I was actually quite impressed with the machinist's job of uh, 0.8 thousandth of an inch height of dome. So he did a, a, a quite a good job there. And there's the, the profile of it. And that was supplied to me by, uh, by Jose. So uh, we did do that. And we haven't actually tested it yet, because uh, right now we only have one working demo uh, that uh, we don't want to do anything that we haven't normally done to it because we have the aerospace testing and things of that nature coming up. So we want to have a device that we can, we can loan. Um, so we, we haven't tested how, how much difference this will make, but we think it may make a, a significant difference to the performance of these devices. So Peggy, how did you guys guess of this, or come to the conclusion of, of the dome? I believe it's a typical thing they do with some kind of stamping. They do it with beams and stuff as well. Yeah. Um, they they preload a beam designed in such a way so that when you load it, it's flat. Right. And again, Jose mentioned again that you wouldn't take a, a stone wheel and just have flat edges. You'd, yeah. you'd uh, camphor the edges so that they don't crack. And this is the basically the same thing. So the tires are always camphored and, and come up at the sides oh, like that. Oh, I'm saying that Earth basically not touching your face. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that is, we're not doing anything yet. Not, not doing anything yet. Throw that out there right now. We're not doing anything. No, you're not doing anything yet. Um, anyway. Moving on, so, so we, we've got a solution to this then. We can make a nice even distribution by using these domed end caps and, uh, and uh, end masses, and, and that looks like it will work fairly, fairly nicely. I can't guarantee whether it will be a, a, give us an enhancement in the thrust or not, but it, it certainly will hopefully prevent cracking crystals uh, in the future. And there's Jose, and he was the one that suggested the, uh, the change. And this is just some of his code from uh, <laughs> using that, that 
spring and, and uh, model that you mentioned in Estes Park. Now, I wanted to come to this part. This is the voltage to the fourth power scaling law. Uh, previously, we'd had, um, I was checking the time here, previously we, we had uh, a plot which had maybe four points on it. And uh, we thought maybe four points on the graph wasn't all that uh, convincing. So we decided to do a series of tests uh, using the, the chirps, actually. Each chirp is a different run um, to show this V to the uh, fourth uh, power law. So let me uh, move on and show you the actual data. So it's so, a great job that Jim did. It's a very great job that Jim did, yes. A, a, a few days before our temper. Actually, it was, it was a lot more than that because, uh, uh, oh, here I've written down, it was uh, 0.15 volts on this scale is about one micronewton, just, just so you know. So you're reading volts on the scale here. So you have to convert using 0.15 is roughly one micronewton. Uh, now what you see here is a bunch of series, right? Every series was taken on a different day. So there's all these bunches on in different colors are showing all the different days where he was taking data. And some of them are the same color, but they're different symbols. So there's an awful lot of data taken here. It was from the middle of, of August uh, through, through September, the data was being taken. So it, it took an awful long time to get, get the data. These are all specifically uh, for forward runs. So the device was in a specific orientation. Um, and uh, you see that the massive data that we've now, uh, that we've now collected. And, um, what else have I got here? These are the forward ones actually put onto Excel and then done. Uh, there's a regression that's been done. And the number here, you, I don't think you can see it very well. In fact, I can't see it very well and I haven't even got my glasses on. So I think it's th th for the forward runs, it was slightly lower. Look, maybe I can see it on here. It's uh, 3.179. Uh, so for the so for this power here, 3.179 for forward runs. That's what we got just by letting the thing do its regression and put the best fit curve through there. And the R squared there is 0.8633, so it's a pretty decent R squared. So instead of V to the fourth, it's V to the three It's points. over, yeah, it's over three anyway. But let yeah. me show you, this is just for the forward runs. Let me show you also the reverse runs. So here's a bunch of data taken for reverse runs. Again, the different uh, colors and different symbols represent different days of data being taken. And here you see a whole bunch of data. And uh, that was also uh, put under uh, regression on, on Excel. And uh, this is what we got. So uh, for the reverse runs, this was the best fit curve. And here you see very clearly is 3.79. Again, with the R squared of 0.8. This is just telling you how, how well the, the curve fits all the, all the points on, on average. So that's not a bad R squared. So V to the 3.979. And uh, that actually agrees very well with what we got last time, just with those four points that we had. Four points were sort of in this cluster and that cluster. These, these, again, clusters sort of represent the voltages that we can alter just by switching the amplifier, our guitar amp. We put it to a certain uh, level and then switch the level, and then uh, we, we get a certain voltage range as you can see in here. So there seems to be columns of data, and that's just because uh, the crudeness of our amplifier and how we can adjust it. So uh, all these is roughly the same voltage here, roughly the same amplifier voltage there. Again, it's sort of four columns. So this is what we're, we're seeing. Roughly voltage to the, to the four. Certainly over three, and uh, but 3.79 in that particular case, yes. So yeah. maybe we should remark the significance of this. The significance being in that it is a very unusual to have a force that goes uh, almost like the fourth power. You would, if the force would go like the square of the voltage, right? You could uh, blame that on a number of things. Maybe it comes power. to do with thermal. Thermal, yeah. thermal power, yeah. Mm -hmm. But the, the fact that it goes like the, almost like the fourth power, it's a very unusual thing. Yes, it is. It's one of the things, and also the fact that that agrees with uh, Jim's theory is uh, quite, uh, quite interesting. Good yes, thing. it is. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah, just to be sure, the force is negative in that reverse run. Yes, that was a reverse run. So the force is in the opposite direction to the ones I showed previously. I, I just wanted to remind people the first measurements of Faraday's you know, Coulomb's law, you know, were very tenuous. And, and the person the Coulomb said, ah, it looks like R squared. <laughs> and so that's what he thought was, you know, but it, it, the, the first data was, was, you know, a little, a little scratchy like this, but it worked okay. out just fine. But there's certainly enough data points now. We can't say there's just four data points. There's a bunch no. of data points. And this was the best fit curve that, that Excel could come up with. So if that's... If it was just a V to the fourth, how bad would the fit be? If, oh, I, I don't think you'd, you'd hardly notice. I don't think you'd hardly notice from, from this. 
-hmm. I mean, that's so close um, that I don't think. I mean, and this is a fairly high number, so. Uh, Did it hit some of the higher points better? Yeah, it yeah, would. It was, would. Instead of the middle points, it, it would. The so some of these better. middle ones may have been slightly off, and some of these higher ones may have been a bit better. So maybe it would go through these sort of in the middle of these yeah. two. So let's say. Uh, yeah. So. Anyway. Um, I thought I'd also show you the little lab, the, the, the tiny lab that we now have. Um, you have those mountains. I do, I do. Uh, yes, because it was a, a 10 by 13 inch, a, a 10 by 13 foot room, I decided to make it look a bit bigger by putting some mountains at the back. And of course, we both enjoy the view. Um, and, and here you see, I've, I've got a little to story to tell you. Um, Jim used to have this rather large wooden table, which I never really liked. The wooden, it was a huge wooden table, it was like a big tripod. And for the tripod legs, there were big uh, sort of buckets of water, essentially, big, big uh, barrels of, of water. And on top of the barrels of water were, were inner tubes, like tire inner tubes. And then this big tripod, a wooden thing. And then uh, on top of that, there was a wooden stand with more pneumatic little inflatable things in, on it, little inflatable vibrations. And on top of that was the, a stand that would hold the, the vacuum chamber and lead weights all over everything. So there's lead weights everywhere. Now that thing was fairly large, probably take the space from, from here to about here to uh, beyond the podium. And it was much too big to fit in this little room. So I thought I was doing a big favor by getting some really fancy like optical table legs with a fancy pneumatic, and of course over here underneath the vacuum pump is a little um, compressor. And so this thing would float this granite, which was six inches thick by two foot by three foot, just big enough to hold the device. So I was thinking, great, we've now got this wonderful optical table, and I'm going to float it up, and, and this thing will be perfectly balanced, and it will be perfectly uh, flat, and, and it will take care of itself. And, and I inflated it, and I was adjusting the, the, the little screws, and this thing was tossing and turning and, and bucking like a bronco. And Jim was laughing his head off because he thought it was hilarious. And, and, uh, and I was looking at this thing, and I absolutely could not get that thing to stay stay nicely balanced and uh, of course we eventually I managed to get it balanced but uh, when we looked at the, uh, the the noise level it rather than doing the little noise level that we've been seeing in the previous lab it was doing this like an earthquake <laughs> so uh, it looked like the the, um, the 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 pneumatics was actually amplifying the building noise so it was it was really bad what I had to do was just drop that granite right on the legs so totally don't don't use the, the fancy pneumatics at all just drop it the granite right on the legs just use the legs as Big, big weights basically, and um, and then it worked just fine. So without, so the night all the floating table, I should have not done any of that. But that's, that's basically, I'm a theorist. I didn't know what I was doing. I thought it was a big improvement, and it was absolutely terrible. So that was probably the worst thing I did. But uh, so Jim, Jim knew what. The other day, one of my colleagues at the University of Washington prefers stacks of telephone books. Telephone books. You see, I could have, I could have saved about four thousand dollars and bought telephone books. Oh man. Back issues of National Geographic. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we have this this cute little optical table now that maybe I'll get to use with some some lasers at some point. But I could I could just use a stack of phone books now. Now I know uh, it sh that would have been a, a big savings. But here's our vacuum pump. Here's all the electronics that Jim uses. And back here, I used to have a rack with all the amplifiers on that we had. But Jim didn't like the rack, so I had to remove it. It was a bit big for the room. I now have in my office a huge rack full of amplifiers. Looks really cool. Cool, but uh, <laughs> it looks very scientific and cool like but uh, it didn't really belong in the lab so we have a, a small table here now and on the other side of the room looking looking the other op other way you see that we we've used every inch of wall space to stack up all our equipment and here again is the uh, is the chamber and beneath here lurking is croc I don't know if you can see him but he's down there somewhere so uh, it's, <laughs> so we have all the same bits and paraphernalia and perf prayer flags and all the rest of it are still in the room uh, and it's all been taken down to this small room. I'm hoping that uh, Martin and, his, and, uh, and the crew will get to visit on Saturday and uh, see the thing running. And that pretty much concludes my, uh, my little talk. Is that the window to the outside? That is actually a window to the outside and you actually see real mountains out there. Would it, would it be better when you run the test to, um, before it to shut it off? So it is facing south and we can lower the blinds and uh, it doesn't get really hot in there at all. If it was facing, uh, sorry, sorry, it's facing north. If it was a, a south facing window, I would worry about the heat. Mm -hmm. My office has a window that faces south and by gum it gets really hot. But this one is, is cool to the touch and, and I can lower the blinds. It doesn't really make any difference. We, we've not noticed any, any major difference from the window. <coughs> I was actually thinking about that, but uh, Jim said it wouldn't make a difference, and he was right, it didn't make any difference. So uh, 
Anyway, that's the little setup. I don't think I have anything else. I just wanted to say thanks to all my collaborators on the NIAC proposal, and here they all are. Uh, fortunately, Marshall Eubanks couldn't make it. He had an interesting talk to give us, um, and that pretty much is, is it. And there's a couple of quotes for you as well. So thank you very much. And I'll take any questions. We are roughly on time. I think I can't see the clock very well, but my wire watch is about 25 past four. Right. So if, if there are any questions, I'll take them. Have you ever thought of like um, taking this up and like the, uh, the, you know, the zero gravity flight and just seeing if you can get some kind of thing to move around or, or uh, putting it in a, in a fluid medium with battery power and seeing if you can get it to move? We have thought of putting it in a vacuum chamber um, on some kind of uh, floating system, maybe either magnetic, Magnets. magnetic or, or uh, air type system, and then rotating it. Mm -hmm. It would rotate very slowly, but we could put we could film it and then speed up the film and then you see it rotating. So that, that's a possibility. Um, there's also a possibility of trying for a NIAC two and, and see if we can we can do something with that. But uh, that, all of that experimentation requires money, which we don't have. So that's the trouble. Um. Yes, yeah, th this would help. Uh, SSI does support us, so uh, uh, that's what this is for. <laughs> okay. Well, if not, I'd like to thank. Oh, okay. So maybe you can say a couple of words about the, your interstellar uh, ship design. <laughs> oh, well, I didn't bring any slides about the interstellar ship design, but uh, uh, if you look on the SSI website, uh, you will find a video, and it talks about, it's, it's the NIAC uh, symposium, and I talked about uh, uh, the ship that we hope to uh, basically tw take 20 years to get out to Proxima Centauri, and uh, five years to send the data back, so uh, this is using mega drives. <laughs> of course, it's very, very enthusiastic uh, uh, <laughs> report, uh, but in principle, if we had the, the time and the money to spend. Uh, maybe in the next 20 years we could, we could build something. And so it basically shows the kind of things that you could do if you had the time and the money. When you run that thing, a really good advantage to show uh, its advantage is that you stop when you reach the destination. Yes, yeah. we can stop. Rockets. Other than Starshot, that, that always have to shoot by and they don't have yeah. that very long to take the data. And if they're not pointing in the right direction, they miss it altogether. So, and I also worry about Starshot. How are they gonna get the information back? And it takes 20 years for them to... Yeah, 20 years to send the data back. Because they're sending the data back at a very slow rate because they're very, using very low power. Right, so, mm -hmm. right. So there won't be anybody alive to remember the launch that's going to receive the data. And I worry that the optics on those very small chips is not going to be very good. Remember the launch that will get to see the data. <laughs> so what, what is the maximum speed of your spaceship? The maximum speed was about 0.4 C. And that's assuming that we get to the halfway point in 10 years and then um, so accelerate for 10 years and then decelerate for 10 years so that we end up at the d destination and can coast in. Yeah. And, uh, What's your acceleration rate? <laughs> hey, the acceleration rate wasn't that high. I, I believe it was something like 0.4 um, meters per second squared. But what was the payload? The payload was about 500 kilograms. And uh, the whole ship was something like 15, 15 tons, metric tons. And it was about the size of a 747, uh, that kind of size. I mean, yeah. If you could package the device uh, to fly on a zero-G flight, is that something you would be capable or willing or interested in doing? I think in the near future, yes. We, we just need to get enough devices, at least two or more, so to do a spin type of test or to do a trans orbital transfer test. We'd, we'd want to have a slightly better device, a more reliable one than we have right now. So maybe in a year or two, when we've had a, a bit, bit more time to test. And of course, we want to test these other materials, and we haven't had a chance yet. So the crystal structure is very promising. We'd, we'd really want to get a test of that. And then, then maybe after doing that, we, we could think about sending something up and flying it. Are there any other questions? Otherwise, I'd like to thank all of you for coming. So I think you made it a wonderful conference. And uh, I've really enjoyed it. And uh, I hope you all did as well. And uh, you'll all be getting an invitation to uh, Estes Park 2018, or the Advanced Proportion Workshop. We haven't decided where to go yet. I like Estes Park, but I know it's a bit of a high altitude. So uh, I don't know whether aerospace would invite us back. Is that a possibility, Greg? Absolutely. I think it's a possibility, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks again, Heidi. Really appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome.